so the thing, the things to deal with in this presentation is the initial constants of all Chinese um, compared to those of Chinese languages. Um, actually, the original topic is kind of too vague, so I decided to focus on the morphology part. Um, so this is one of the goals of this talk. Um, and because Guillaume Jacques has done a similar presentation some 10 years ago, so I'm here, the other goal is to show how little progress has been, has been made during this decade. Um, I'll be presenting the, um, actually, I might be presenting the things you might have known before, and I hope there are still new things, and I will present some comments um, on the vaccine surveillance system of both Chinese. So first I would like to talk about Jarungic languages. So Jarungic is a group of languages in the San Tibetan family. Um, they're spoken mainly in Zhengawa prefecture in Sichuan province in China. So there are three sub-branches in Jarungic, um, Jarung, Krosja, and Hopa. Um, there are four Jarung languages, Situ, Jakuk, Tsogdung, and Zbu. Uh, many of you may be familiar with Situ or even Jakuk, thanks to Yong here. Um, and Zbu is currently studied by Gong Xun Dai. Um, he's now collected data from several dialects. And Krosja is now the subject of my, my PhD uh, thesis. I'm working now on a um, core Krosja dialect, namely Wubzi, which is in red on the handout. And I also possess data from several other dialects, Siyue Wu dialect, Guanyin Xiao dialect, etc. And then Hopa, there are at least three Hopa languages, uh, Staos, Dozde, Geshi. Um, actually, Hopa is fancied by a lot of um, scholars working on Jarungic languages, so there are actually a lot of articles on it. Jarungic languages exhibit templatic morphology, um, that is to say that every verb is with a chain of affixes, in our case prefixes, and every prefix has its own predetermined slot um, that no one can change. So here in table one, you can see the verbal template of Wubzi cross -tabs. Um, we've got inflectional prefixes, derivational prefixes, and so on. So what do these mean to the initial system? Um, let's have a look at the derivational prefixes in the middle. They are mostly <coughs> consonantal in Trostyab. So they are consonants, but consonants with grammatical functions. So they are materials to make um, complex clusters. Actually, Trostyab has the most complex um, consonant cluster system in Sino Tibetan, <coughs> probably. So every scholar who has studied Trostyab has attested more than 300 consonant clusters in each dialect, and some words even have a cluster of five consonants. You can see these examples at the beginning of section two with examples of four or five consonants consecutively. So, for example, in Guanyin Tao, you've got um, um, an example with five consonants, uh, which means to geminate, and in Wubzi, you've got something like einste, So, just take a quick look, that will do. Um, so the most important thing is, especially <coughs> in verbs, nearly every consonant has a function. For instance, in 1a, um, r is reciprocal, and n there is autoinfective, and the z there is causative, infixed between the stem. And the y here may be a historical prefix too. So nearly every consonant in the cluster actually means something. And in 1b, this, this exact example is how six prefixes can come together to form a finite verb. He, he didn't cause um, me to kill myself for his sake. Um, having seen all these examples, let's turn to some old Chinese forms. In two, example two, um, <coughs> reconstructed by Baxter Sagar. I actually, I randomly um, picked several examples with um, complex clusters. So, um, what I want to share with you is how Jarungic languages help all Chinese out uh, when we're in doubt. So um, I want to talk mainly about parallel morphology between Jarungic and Chinese. So some of you may have the same feeling as I do when you open a book like Old Chinese uh, New Reconstruction when it comes to morphology, you may find prefixes there, proposed there are somewhat ad hoc. A lot of prefixes have too many functions. Some of the functions are undetermined. 
Actually, ideally, I think, in a reconstruction, if we got one thing right, we got everything right. If the phonology of the current reconstruction reflects exactly the mother tongue of our ancestors, my ancestors, um, it must be indubitably um, correct morphology-wise. Um, but if we just look at Chinese alone, we might not have many insights about the morphology. So maybe we should now turn to related languages that preserve a certain amount of morphology to do the comparative work. Um, in Baxter's Cigar 2014, we have already seen how the authors look Tibeto-Burman comparativism. And they say the fact that some Tibeto-Burman languages have such and such an affix with such and such a function is merely suggestive but cannot be decisive for reconstructing the morphology of all Chinese. I thoroughly agree with this point, but even if it's only suggestive, it's still seductive. If we find anything with nearly the same appearance and function, then it will be a strong piece of evidence that our reconstruction is right. So it surely makes us more confident. Um, okay, let's get down to business. First, I would like to talk about the T prefix that we have seen uh, earlier this afternoon. The pre-initial T, T as a pre-initial, pre is reconstructed to account for a number of CFM series that show its evidence. For, in for instance, the claim to be read with the phonetic claim, a uh, vein of water. So, if you want to, wanted to derive a, a, a zhizu character in Middle Chinese, you must want to reconstruct a T pre-initial there to account for the sound change <coughs> to, to dr, for instance. Some of the T pre-initials are considered only part of the stem, some of them prefixes. Um, there are two T prefixes in Old Chinese according to the book. Uh, it forms, first, it forms intransitive verbs, and um, uh, for instance, uh, to go out, come out, and tnip to fear, something like that. And it, it occurs in um, inalienable nouns. Just see the examples in example three. <clears throat> so these are um, some examples of inalienable nouns with the T prefix. So this is what we are seeking. Actually, in Jarungic language, languages, we do find a similar prefix. Uh, for instance, in Japug, there is a prefix for indefinite or generic possessor for inalienably possessed nouns. And, um, and the indefinite possessive prefix has two variants, d and d. Um, the distribution is uh, actually lexically determined. So we can see the examples in 4. In 4a, d is the indefinite <coughs> possessed noun prefix. Um, d jo means oneself and you can substitute it with other prefixes of possession. With a in 4b, you have ajo, which means myself, um, and nejo, you, and um, in 4d, ajo, uh, third person singular, himself. In 5, you've got more nouns. So notice that the word for elbow is cognate to, uh, to Chinese the uh, group jo. In Jakub, it's disgr. Um, and you can also find traces in trostia, in six. The verb means fist, and zbya, which um, probably comes from tbya, plate, and dna, source. So this, that's it for, for the T prefix. And then section five, um, anti-causative and causative construction. <coughs> uh, maybe some of you still remember in 2012, there has been a debate in the journal Language and Linguistics uh, Mei Zulin, 2012, was the first article in that journal, and Sagar Baxter, 2012, the second. Um, it was about the famous voicing alternation in Old Chinese. A actually, Mei Zulin holds that voicing alternation is due to an S prefix to an intransitive voiced base. The, the S prefix was causative, and the voiced, the voiced consonant. While Sagar Baxter think that it was an N, capital N prefix, added to a transitive voiceless base um, and reconstructs the S pre-initial for other purposes. It is nearly undoubtful that Meijulin was wrong if we just take a look at Jarungic languages. But let's have a look at the Chinese examples given in Baxter and Sagar, their reconstruction first. So in example seven, um, to defeat Prats and to suffer defeat, Prats later became Brats with the voiced consonant. 
and debt to bend to break transitively, uh, debt to bend intransitively, and the famous to see, gains and gains to appear. Um, the Japut list is in table two. We can see that the intransitive counterpart uh, parts are pre-nasalized. This looks so much like the um, Baxter and Sagar reconstruction, and it's even productive in Japu. <coughs> I'd like to draw your attention to the last word in Table Two. Khtar to disperse comes from Tibetan khtar, and um, but its intransitive counterpart andar um, <coughs> is not a Tibetan loan word, so it is um, actually invented inside the Japu language. Mm, table three are the examples in Zbu Jarong, provided by Gongshun, also with pre-nasalization on the anti <coughs> counterpart. In table four, you've got a list in Wobzi cross steps. Even though the intransitive counterparts are not pre-nasalized, we're confident that voice stops in cross step come from um, pre-nasalized stops. Um, there is a sound change to account for this, a change shift. Um, so the direction must be from a voiceless to a pre-nasalized verb, which later became a, a, voiced, a, verb, a voiced initial. Therefore, the reconstruction of Baxter's cigar does make sense from a Jarundek point of view. And now what about the S causative? Um, Baxter and Sagar lists some examples of causative exa uh, causatives with an S prefix in example 8, in our handout. Uh, Stung to rise and stung to lift up and not to speak frankly and snot to complain to accuse and dung to match and stung to estimate and geep to see to look and skip uh, to show. So we can see they do have them. the S do, does have a causative function. So a sibilant causative is present in a lot of some Tibetan languages. Um, in Jarungek as well. The S causative in Krostya is somewhat very complicated. There are a lot of morphophonological processes leading to really complex consonant, consonant clusters. Um, if, we look, if we look at the Siyo Wu dialect of Krostya, here in <coughs> example 9, you have clusters like something like that. It's 9A. So, uh, yeah. Um, actually, two of the four examples in Baxter and Sagar are still a little bit doubtful. Um, um, uh, Snot to complain to accuse and um, to show skips. Actually, there is a um, suffix s there. So, which one is the causative? The prefix or the suffix? Uh, or both? So, um, actually, uh, we may leave it to Guillaume Jacques tomorrow to see what happens with the final s. And then the normalization part. Amongst Jarungic languages, only Jarung, the Jarung language, preserves the oldest normalization, no, normalizing strategy. Normalization is used mainly in relative constructions. Jarung dialects uh, use different prefixes to indicate the function. For, for instance, in um, Jakuk Jarung, G denotes the S or the A, G the P and sir, the O of Li. Additionally, a K-based prefix for infinitives. In Topden Jaru, <coughs> you have nearly the same prefixes. So in example 10, I list how these prefixes work in Topden Jaru, with the verb nzi to eat. Um, means he who, he who eats, and gunze that is eaten, sun eating place, and gunze to eat, eating, something like that. So now let's have a look at the old Chinese K prefix. <coughs> Baxter and Sagar described the K prefix as deriving non-finite verbs that can be read as nouns. For instance, ghost. <coughs> it is probably cognate with um, to ui or inspiring and uis to fear to threaten. And kpang square basket may it may the original meaning might be something square to the square, so it is related to uh, fang square, <coughs> and maybe um, kru, deceased father, um, it is related to ru, to be old. So these k prefixes 
seem to, seem to be some kind of SA normalization or the infinitive girl in German. Maybe they're cognates. So now 6.2, the oblique S. Oblique can mean several things. The surrounding environment, the instrument, um, the time, the moment, the recipient, etc. We should look at some Japruk examples first to make it clearer. Um, in example 12, fset um, means to talk to, uh, uh, no, to talk actually. Um, and if you add an oblique s prefix, s prefix there, you, you have fset. It means the one to talk to, the recipient. And uh, yi means to plant. Um, if you got um, <coughs> yi, it means the time to plant. And yi means to come. Asa yi means the place to come. So um, if you look at the old Chinese examples given uh, in Baxter and Cigar 2014, you will find it amazing that this one's exactly look the same. Ngrak, um, to go against, reverse. Snuck. Uh, first day of the month originally when the moon changes from waning to waxing. And Hong to penetrate. Strong uh, uh, window where light penetrates. And Mount to flee to disappear. And Smong morning uh, burial. And finally, Le to take to use. Sula, a handle of plow sickle, uh, which originally mean, meant. Uh, instrument of holding. So the reconstruction is convincing both phonology wise and morphology wise um, according to our gerontic languages. Um, and now let's come to denominalization. There are a lot of denominal prefixes in gerontic languages with different degrees of productivity. They have different functions as you can find in Table 5 and Table 6 with Japuk Jarong and Wabzi Trusters. Our task now is to see if all Chinese had similar prefixes. First, 7.1, the nominal capital N. I found three representative examples in all Chinese um, in example 14, gu, uh, a long time, and gu, um, to be all to be used, and guin to be even uniform, uh, which probably um, is derived from an unattested base queen, which probably meant cycle. And the third example, I, I like this one, um, guang white <coughs> and guang to be yellow. And in 15 and 16, we have general examples with the n denominal prefix. I think n denominal is the most productive in general language. <coughs> Maybe. Um, and 7.2. The denominal M. So this M prefix uh, differs from the capital N prefix in that it has different reflexes in Proto Min and Vietnamese, etc. That is to say, um, a nasal other than a capital N must be reconstructed for those examples, but we don't know which. We could have opted for something like N1 or N2, but it might make us feel more comfortable with an actual bilabial. And the bilabial seems to be the most reasonable one, since in Jarong phonology, uh, Jarongic phonology, the capital N and the bilabial M are distinct pre-initial morphemes, uh, phonemes. Sorry. Um, in Japrug, an, an M denominal derives transitive verbs with body part or intransitive verbs of position. You can see the examples in 17. Merzab uh carrying shoulder and mapu to be happened before um, uh, and machtel to be in the middle. And according to Baxter and Sagar, their M the nominal derived volitional verbs, as in 18. Uh, you can derive from relay post to transmit and uh, poison, um, duk and dux to poison and Price cloak, and price to cover, or the price to cover oneself with, and bucks back. Oh, here we've got a body part, um, and got bucks to turn the back on, and maybe you can add tongue and tongue 
Trao, something like a go to morning audience at court, and maybe talks <coughs> to gather, to bring together, um, which might be related to Tibetan uh, talk, the plural marker. So these are the M prefix. But um, whether it is related to Jakut or M, to, to Jarong M is still doubtful. And then the denominal S. Um, I've got one example here, but there may be many more. So to, this one is from uh, the noun position to um, arrange in order, to, in order to order, something like that. In 20, you have some examples of the nominal S in Wubzi Khrushchev. So just take a quick look. And now, what about the um, infix R in Old Chinese? They could also be denominal, as in 21, you got la, la to remove, something like that. Um, its cognate could be found in Jaku with an R based denominal prefix um, deriving mainly intransitive verbs. But the old Chinese forms we've, we found are mostly transitive to remove something, to store something. Only the third one is intransitive. So are they related? I'm not sure. Unfortunately, I failed to find examples in Trusta. Um, so now in section 8, I would like to talk something about the typology. Um, in a language um, such as Trusta, <coughs> with a long initial clusters, the consonants are strictly aligned. We cannot change their positions. But this may not be the original look. The fact that they are so well aligned is because they must obey a certain sonority hierarchy, as in 23, to facilitate the pronunciation. The most sonorous consonants are placed in the outer slot, and the least sonorous ones are placed in the inner slot. Um, that is probably why they, show, they, they now show a tempathetic morphology. So there is a correlation between phonology and morphology. In Old Chinese, however, the members of an initial cluster are interchangeable position-wise. For instance, in 24, S and M, and S and capital N can swap positions. And so then the positions are not predetermined. So it seems that Old Chinese had a layered morphology. The most clear example may be 25, the base verb was done to ascend, um, and then a causative S is added, makes it to mean to increase, and then an N prefix may be. Um, intransitivizing and makes it to be double or to be in two stories. Mm -hmm. And next you may want to see the, the case of um, Sien Covert's desire with an unknown base, an N prefix which makes it stative and then an S to make it transitive. So you got Sien Garfs, something like that. Um, it seems that the affixes added are only sensitive to the, to the outermost affix. So I think that Layered type of morphology was what proto sino tibetan should look like, since it is hard to imagine a language to be born templatic, I think. Um, in 8.2, I would like to talk about the tightly and loosely attached presyllables proposed by Bax and Sagar. Um, the difference between them is that a loosely attached presyllable is a half syllable with the schwa in between. So, um, I've heard a lot of um, criticisms pointing about, so um, I would like to in, uh, introduce the cross jab case, see examples in. Um, so, first, let's see ex the examples in 26. Um, actually, um, the tightly attached presyllables and loosely attached presyllables have different reflexes in, old, in Middle Chinese, so the opposition must be reconstructed. So this is already not to be criticized. And typologically, from a general point of view, it is also not weird. Okay, thank you. Um, in cross jabs, we have traces of something that can be regarded as tightly and loosely attached pre-initials. Please look at 27, the um, causative forms of Siyu cross jab. So the base verbs here, to suck in the mouth, and to step, both have a um, pre-initial surfacing as M. 
but they are intrinsically different. The causative prefix S is infixed between the nasal and the stop. And in 27A, the nasal is fricativized into an F sound, and in 27B, the nasal stays a nasal. I suppose that the nasal that becomes an F with the causative prefix be tightly attached if we follow Baxter's Sagas term, and <coughs> um, that the one that stays nasal be loosely attached since it interacts less with the causative prefix. Therefore, the most convenient way to reconstruct these two is also to posit a, a pre-syllable with the schwa. So there's nothing bizarre about this reconstruction. And um, I will quickly make one more comment on um, the famous, um, and famous uh, pharyngealization. So very quickly, for type B syllables, there are basically three approaches, um, a medial yod, uh, long vowels, or only plain consonants opposed to pharyngealized type A syllables. Um, there are not much direct evidence for this pharyngealization. Baxter Sagar have some indirect arguments for it. Uh, in 29, one of them is from the description of an author native of the Old Chinese. He said the one without pharyngealization is outer and shallow, and the one with is inner and deep. Pharyngealized consonants are more difficult to pronounce. And another piece of evidence is that in some loan words, the source had no medial yod, for instance, uh, for Buddha, borrowed indirectly from Sanskrit, Buddha, which had no medial between the consonant and the vowel. So you can't really expect the old Chinese loan word had a yod. Um, so um, the yod must be rather light. So if there is no yod for type B, we have to get something done with type A. That is probably pharyngealization that prevented palatalization. The contrast may be observed, might be observed in cross step with certain rhymes, but I'm um, not really sure. See table seven. With the R rhyme in cross step, the examples with pharyngealization in Old Chinese have cognates in cross step in R, while those without pharyngealization have cognates in cross step in E. I really don't know if the phenomenon is genetically related or, um, or just a parallel of non-related phenomenon. Um, I didn't have enough time to study carefully, but one day in my life, before I die, I'll figure it out. Um, in 30, I would like to propose another indirect evidence for it. We all know that in Old Chinese, there was a function, functional word, fu, in modern Mandarin, which was something like a complementizer place at the beginning of the sentence. <coughs> This word is a type B word. So if we follow Baxter 92, we have something like bia in Old Chinese. But isn't it weird to have bia at the beginning of a sentence to introduce this clause? If we look at French, we have something similar uh, because we, we always say uh, ba, ba in, in French. So in French, the, the etymology was bien. It's clear, meaning English well, something like that originally with a yacht in between, and it became something without yacht. So it, it is difficult to imagine that old Chinese fu was originally bia. Therefore, a ba reconstruction sounds more natural if you insist that naturalness is vital for uh, reconstruction. So to some extent, the current reconstruction is actually more natural. Um, and on the last page, I got some potential cognates between Chinese and Jarungic languages. Um, these are for you to criticize. Okay. Okay. 